welcome everyone to our Tuesday, October 26, 2021, a uh, regular closed session meeting of the East Bay Mud Board of Directors. Uh, in accordance with Government Code 54953E, this meeting will be conducted by webinar and teleconference only. Uh, a physical location will not be provided for this meeting. Uh, all directors, including myself, are participating remotely. A roll call, please, Madam Secretary. Director Coleman. Present. Director Katz. Present. Director McIntosh. Here. Director Mellon. Present. Director Patterson. Present. Director Young. I'm here. President Lenny. Present. Uh, all right. Uh, if members of the public wish to uh, make a public comment, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. When prompted, please state your name, affiliation if applicable, and topic. The secretary will call each speaker in the order received. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to speak. However, I have the discretion to amend this time based on the number of speakers. The secretary will track time and inform each speaker when the allotted time has concluded. Madam Secretary, do we have any speakers? At the moment, I have four hands, and we're going to start with Cheryl Ledeau. Cheryl, you should be able to unmute your mic, and your three minutes will start now. Thank you, Risha. Uh, good morning, President Linney, board members, General Manager Chan, East Bay Mud employees, and members of the public. My name is Cheryl Ledoux, and I am the Senior New Business Representative in the New Business Office with East Bay Mud. I'm here today to again ask for your consideration for our requested equity adjustment to the Senior New Business Representative and New Business Representative classifications. Last week marked three years since our team submitted our research and proposed revisions to human resources to begin the much needed classification and desk audit study. Intent was to update the nearly three decade old job descriptions to more accurately reflect the work performed by the new business office, as well as propose a change of our job titles to project coordinators. Today also marks nearly five months since we presented the same proposals <clears throat> to management's contract negotiation team and one month since our original request to the board for reconsideration of management's decision. This team spent many hours researching outside agency comparables and East Bay Mud internal comparables, revising job descriptions and presenting our case to the contract negotiation team. We proved in our presentation our job duties have changed significantly over the years, causing us to be performing tasks not included in our current job description and that our proposals are warranted. We showed that our current job description only covers approximately 40% of our daily, weekly, and monthly tasks and does not accurately represent the complexity and importance of the new business office in ensuring all water service connections are in accordance with East Bay MUD's regulations and schedule of rates and charges you, the board, have approved. We've already done a large portion of the work the human resources would have done as a part of the classification and desk audit study. We had assumed at a minimum that our presentation to management's contract negotiation team would instigate contact with our team or manager to discuss the validity of our requests, but no such contact was made. None of the work we have performed or presentations we have given have moved us any closer to a resolution than we were three years ago or even five months ago. We're also concerned that the upcoming retirements of two crucial managers within human resources will further derail and delay our efforts. Please review our presentation and research documentation that shows the need to provide this group the opportunity to negotiate our requested equity adjustment and to make the necessary changes to our titles and job descriptions. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Cheryl. Next, we have Eric L. Eric, you should be able to unmute your mic. And your three minutes will start now. Thank you, Risha. This is Eric Larson, President of AFSCME Local 444. Good morning, President Lenny and directors. Good morning, General Manager Clint Chan. Uh, you are all, I am sure, keenly aware of the inflationary pressures on our, on our economy and the concern that this inflation could be long lived on the order of years due to supply chain log jams. Our membership are experiencing it every day at the gas pump and at the grocery store. I'm sure you're also aware of the pressures on wages due to labor shortages. 
The increasing cost of living in the Bay Area makes it increasingly difficult to live near our workplace. That high cost of gas, escalating cost of reliable vehicle impacts our membership. This past Sunday, for instance, when there were eight main breaks, our people were out in the street, in the ditch, in the pouring rain, and staffing every station at the wastewater treatment system, assuring that the highest level of treatment during the largest storm to hit the Bay Area in years. We were the heroes. And throughout this COVID pandemic, which we have reported to work every day while our managers have been home holding remote meetings, we have been in the ditch, shoulder to shoulder, keeping the water running and the sewage treated. We are the heroes in public service. We are the, the public recognizes that. The public recognizes us as the heroes in public service. And it's time for the district to recognize us as the heroes in public service. We're in the street, in the ditch every day. Rain or shine to recognize us with meaningful wages and increases that maintain our cost of living and to recognize us as heroes, as the essential workers we are, the skilled and indispensable, maintaining our critical infrastructure with pride and a work ethic that rises to the occasion, that maintains our system in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, throughout the COVID pandemic and beyond every day. It will be 19 months since we've had a wage increase. And at the same time, we've seen well over 5% increase in the cost of living, the increase in fuel, to get to work and the increase in the groceries at the store and the increases in our rent. We are not mediocre. We're not mediocre workers. We are the best keeping, it takes three to five years to train just our plumber, just a basic level of plumber, just a basic level of wastewater treatment plant operator. Our mechanics are far none the best. Our heavy equipment operators, far none the best. But our morale is affected when we don't feel valued, when management seems to, to imply that we're mediocre. We don't, our morale is affected. It's time to increase your negotiator's authority. And it's time to, to recognize our contribution and to recognize that we are heroes reporting to work every day to serve the district and the public. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, uh, and a, a thank you to your members for, for their hard work uh, and, and being heroes at the, at the district and amongst the public. I definitely recognize that. Thank you. Next, we have Nick Lawrence. You should be able to unmute your mic. And your three minutes will start now. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for attending episode six of a dangerous condition of public property. Today's episode is Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. I am Nick Lawrence reminding you that the fire hydrant on Tappan Terrace remains a danger to the public. I was updating my umbrella insurance policy a couple of days ago for my residents on Tappan Terrace where they asked who the primary insurer is. I indicated East Bay Mud was the underlying fire insurer with unlimited exposure. This because, and I've received written confirmation of this, East Bay Mud has falsely reported to my local fire department, which relies upon such critical information, that fire hydrant H14100 on Tappan Terrace in Arenda is presently flowing the same as before the East Bay Mud water main break of March 2020. Each of you knows this representation by East Bay Mud to be false because the two inch rubber hose, which now services the hydrant at the same low pressure of 12 PSI, cannot possibly deliver the same flow as an eight inch pipe, which East Bay Mud no longer provides to the hydrant. Curiously, this false flow information was transmitted to East Bay Mud by the fire department, by East Bay Mud personnel, who within the past few days, even though hydrant H14100 is still noted in East Bay Mud's internal database, as being out of service since March 2020 due to a main break and absent any record of flow testing being performed on that hydrant since 2002. Are you listening? In April 2021, six months ago, Mr. Carlton Chan, East Bay Mud Engineering Manager, called me at the request of his brother, General Manager Clifford Chan, 
and assured me that East Bay Mud would promptly put into place water supply to the Tappan Terrace fire hydrant via a eight inch pipe protected against fire. As he and I spoke, this could be a new pipe buried or exposed or reuse and repair of the broken pipe. But in either case, I could expect to see fortunes likely tighter construction on site within a couple of weeks. I'm still waiting. The two inch rubber hose, which remains the sole water supply for six homes and hydrant H14100 is insufficient for its intended fire suppression and domestic consumption purposes. Imparts objectionable taste and odor and possibly hazardous PFAS forever chemicals into the domestic water supply is vulnerable to the threats of vandalism, vehicles and fire and will deliver an inadequate flow. A slightly larger four inch rubber hose will have the identical infirmities. The broken water main is open to daylight now and could be readily returned to service as it needs but a four foot section spliced into it. In the meantime, East Bay Mud remains my primary fire insurer and that of my neighbors in Sleepy Hollow. And despite the drizzle over the past few days, the risks of home fires and fire season is still here. Come on guys and gals, directors and managers, please do the right thing and correct the dangerous condition of public property by restoring the functionality of fire hydrant H14100 in the manner that your Mr. Chan assured me would be done and do it now. Once again, I thank you. That concludes my statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence for your update. Next, we have George Cleveland. George, you should be able to unmute your mic and your three minutes will start now. Thank you, Risha. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, uh, Board of Directors, President Linney, other members of the board, Chairman Chan, district employees, and anyone else on the call. Um, I just have a couple of things, uh, union related, not negotiations, but union related. Uh, the first one, uh, it's kind of strange. Uh, there's an investigation, fact finding going on involving multiple local 2019 employees. But we have determined that one of them is in there incorrectly, mistaken identity. And I think we've, we've proven that to HR, yet this person continues to be kept in with everybody else. And it's causing this person undue stress. And maybe the board can uh, ask Laura to find out what specifically is going on because we'd like, to, we'd like to remove this person from that process. And we also hope that as part of that removal that the individual gets an apology for being, uh, for being mistakenly included in it. That, that there seems to be a reluctance to do that. I'm not sure why, because we do all make mistakes and apologizing for a mistake means that you're acknowledging it. It's a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. So we're hoping that's taken care of. I'm not gonna bring up the person's name here because I don't think that that's necessary. Um, so the other part, I will mention the name. Um, as you know, my, my coworker and fellow member of the contract company, Nancy Evans, you know that she is uh, uh, outspoken in, against the vaccine mandate. And, you know, everyone is entitled to his or her own opinions. Uh, the concern that I have is that it appears that uh, someone is not taking that well. Uh, about a week, week and a half ago, uh, the supervisor said, uh, emails her or Teams chats her and said, hey, were you on the second floor of the administration building between like, some dates in August and some dates in September? And it's like, no context. And it's like, that's the type of question that you can't answer uh, one way or another without context. And I, I took exception to that because I was, you know, I was forwarded to me and I, let the supervisor and everybody in the chain, command chain, know up to the GM know that that's inappropriate. And the, the reply that I got back from the supervisor indicates that the supervisor isn't doing this individually, that the supervisor is being directed to do this. So I, I, I wanna make this clear. While we have differences on the vaccine mandate and whether people should be vaccinated or not, or tested or not, we are entitled to our own opinions and we should not be harassed for that. So. East Bay Mud will not harass members for their opinions. They will allow people to have their opinions and they will not set out to try to trap employees and catch them in a lie. That's inappropriate. 
East Bay, let me repeat that, East Bay Mud will not harass its employees on this topic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, George. Thank you. Next, we have Yvette Rivera. Yvette, you should be able to unmute your mic. And your three minutes will start now. Thank you, Risha. At the last board meeting, I talked about the government tort complaint submitted by Ariel Bland and Saji Pierce against East Bay Mud, Craig Spencer, and Laura Costa. I read a couple of paragraphs from Ms. Pierce's uh, government tort complaint at the last board meeting, and today I'll read a few paragraphs from Ms. Bland's complaint. Again, I'm only reading the factual allegations of the government court, government tort complaint. On page six of uh, the document under constructive discharge, on April 16th, 2020, attorney Saji Pierce reported to Ms. Acosta the following information. Quote, a few months ago, I shared with you my concerns about disparate treatment of our newest attorney, Ariel Bland, and how a number of my colleagues in the OGC had approached me with similar and consistent concerns. I mentioned that I had encouraged each of them to talk to you directly instead of using me as an intermediary, and that for various reasons of their own, each they each decided against it. The common sentiment, sentiment was that they all expressed that they did, did not feel that their voice would be heard or given much weight relative to Craig, who as general counsel is one of the most powerful people in the district. They each were afraid to speak up until now. Since I last spoke with you, spoke to you, the disparate treatment of Ariel has persisted and worsened. And I have continued to hear from people in our office about how upsetting it is to see the stark differences between how Ariel is being treated compared to the much more favorable treatment of Anna Gunderson and Brooke Barnum, the two attorneys hired before Ariel. These differences are clear, directly observable, measurable, and not a matter of opinion. Recently, Ariel shared with me some of her own concerns about being treated differently, and I also encouraged her to talk with you. As a new employee who is eager to establish a good reputation and work relationships, the decision to speak up is harder for her than for anyone else in our office. She feels vulnerable given her probationary period of employment. Yet she too has agreed to talk with you and share her concerns. Speaking plainly, it was heartbreaking to hear her describe the situation, to hear how she had noticed herself what others were seeing, and worse, to see her fear of reprisal or reputational damage should she speak up about it. Ariel is the first minority attorney to be hired in the OGC in 15 years, and the first African-American attorney to be hired in 22 years. I know we can do better than this." End quote. Pa paragraph seven, I mean, page seven, paragraph three. Despite this heartfelt plea for the district to address the staff's concerns about the open and obvious discriminatory treatment of the first African-American attorney to be hired in 22 years, Ms. Acosta engaged in a course of conduct to minimize and defend Mr. Spencer's action. Yvette, I'll stop your there. Three minutes Thank you have... for your time. Thank you. That concludes public comment. I have no other hands. Where is for public right. comment? Uh, thank you. Uh, we will now convene uh, to discuss closed session agenda items. Uh, we're scheduled to return to our regular board meeting at 1.15 p.m. And welcome to our Tuesday, October 26, 2021 regular business meeting of the East Bay Mud Board of Directors. In accordance with government code 54953E, this meeting will be conducted by webinar and teleconference only. A physical location has not been provided for this meeting. Uh, for committee announcements, the redistrict, redistricting ad hoc committee and the sustainability energy committee and the finance administration committee met this morning. These items will be reported out under item 13. All directors, including myself, are participating remotely. Please call a roll, Madam Secretary. Director Coleman. Present. Director Katz. 
Present. Director McIntosh? Here. Director Mellon? Present. Director Patterson is on his way. Director Young? I'm here. President Lenny? I'm here. Uh, please join me in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance. I allegi pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. All right, thank you. We are now uh, on to the fact that there are no announcements required from closed session, and we're on to public comment then. Uh, if members of the public wish to speak on an agenda or not agenda item, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Comments on non-agenda items will be heard in just a moment and comments on agenda items will be heard when the item is up for consideration. When prompted, please share your name, affiliation if applicable and topic. The secretary will call each speaker in the order received. Each speaker is afforded third three minutes three minutes to speak. However, I have the discretion to amend this time uh, based on the number of speakers. The secretary will track time and inform each speaker when the allotted time is concluded. Um, Madam Secretary, do we have speakers for public comment at this time? I don't have a hand up for public comment. Three, all right, there is Yvette Rivera. Yvette, you should be able to unmute your mic and your three minutes will start now. Thank you, Risha. Uh, this morning I read a couple of paragraphs from the Ario Bland government tour complaint against Laura Costa, Craig Spencer, and East Bay Mud. This afternoon I'm going to continue reading several paragraphs, uh, this time from both Ario Bland and Saji Pierce. Um, from the Ario Bland government tour complaint, page four, paragraphs three and four. Mr. Spencer publicly questioned claimant's ability to lead with other attorneys in the office, left, out of, left her out of closed sessions with the board of directors and placed her in secondary roles in the initial draft of her performance plan. According to Mr. Spencer, claimant needed to hold lead or primary roles in order to be promoted to attorney three, yet he designated numer numerous areas of her coverage as being secondary on her performance plan even though claimant was already performing the duties of lead attorney, of a lead attorney. In contrast, Mr. Spencer designated nearly all of Anna Gustafson's areas of coverage as being primary, thereby putting her at an advantage over claimant for promotional purposes. Mr. Spencer also provided Anna G with extensive trainings, including those required by the district to promote from attorney two to attorney three, such as mass trainings. Conversely, Mr. Spencer did not inform claimant of necessary trainings and claimant only found out about mass trainings after a coworker informed her about them eight months later. Mr. Spencer did not promote her and despite the fact that claimant met all the requirements for an attorney three, received and exceeds expectations on her performance appraisal and did more work in comparison to white attorneys on a similar or higher level than her. Mr. Spencer did not show any interest in mentoring or developing claimant as an attorney or having any discussions with her about a path to promotion. That was Ariel Blands. Saji Pierce, page three, paragraph five. Both Mr. Spencer and Laura Costa, the district's human resources manager, made it difficult for claimant to participate in the investigatory process and both made disparaging comments about her to other staff. When the district issued a determination in August 2019, the treatment worsened. Mr. Spencer acted even more hostile towards her and Ms. Acosta discredited her to others involved in the inquiry process. Their conduct made it clear to claimant, made it clear claimant would not receive a fair neutral investigation. Their adverse treatment would likely discourage a reasonable person from opposing discrimination in the future and was a direct result of claimant's initial complaint of discrimination. Following claimant's initial complaint of 2019 regarding Mr. Spencer's discriminatory hiring practices, Mr. Spencer continued to retaliate against claimant and created a hostile work environment for her. 
Mr. Spencer made belittling and unfair comments about claimant's writing and understanding of the English language. Prior to her compla complaints about Mr. Spencer's discriminatory actions, claimant received, had received praise and award for her writing skills. Um, that's all I have regarding uh, those readings of the TOR complaint. I'll continue um, in future board meetings. And I just wanna add, well, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Any other speakers? There are no other speakers for public comment. All right, the comment period for non-agenda items is now closed. Uh, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Items one through nine, right. are there any Please. items to be pulled? Um, President Lenny, we have one additional hand. I have a Diane Riley. All right, we'll open up the comment period again. Thank you. <laughs> Should be able to unmute your mic and your three I, minutes will you start hear me now. now. Yes, yes. your ahead, three Diane. minutes will start Hello. now. Hello, thank you. This is my first time attending a board meeting. I don't even know if this is the appropriate uh, venue, but my name is Diane Riley. I live at 30 Spyglass Hill uh, in Oakland, Hiller Highlands. I'm here with my neighbor, Faye Barron, at number 38 Spyglass Hill. Uh, the Hiller Highlands water tank is directly in front of our homes. Uh, there are some beautiful trees there uh, that we've enjoyed for many years. However, these trees have grown and grown and grown to the point now where they are obstructing our view. We're no longer able to see the city or the Bay Bridge. Um, over the years, I informally called East Bay Mud and spoke with a couple of representatives, asking them to maintain the trees and keep the height down. I never got any kind of a response and it's my fault I didn't pursue it. Some of our other neighbors have pursued trying to get um, East Bay mud to trim the trees, but it seems to um, come to come to an end and nothing gets done. So I would like to request, there's quite a few neighbors who've reached out to me since they heard I was going to be speaking with you. Uh, they would like, they too have their views restricted and would like um, the trees cut. So I'm looking to you for your suggestion on who in East Bay Mud to contact, who can seriously address this issue for us and, and get it done. All right, thank you. You did come to the right place and Clifford, I'll let you yeah, uh, answer that. Diane, thanks for your comments. And um, you said you live at 30 Spyglass um, Hill? Correct. Okay, we yes. will we'll have staff reach out to you and um, uh, discuss with you what you're requesting. And I should clarify that uh, I, I actually used to live at 31 Spyglass Hill. I moved, but I still own 30 Spyglass Hill. It's a rental right now. Okay. Uh, would you like my phone number to um, reach I'll, out to me? Maybe instead of doing it um, on public comment, can you uh, send it to, let me, uh, do you have a pencil? I'll give you an email address. Yes, thank you. Uh, if you could send it to Risha, R-I-S-C, H A dot Cole, C O L E at ebmud.com. If you send her your contact information, we will get back to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank You're you. Uh, are there any other speakers? There are no other speakers for public comment. Going once, All right. twice, done. <laughs> All right, we will close the, the, the comment period for non-agenda items. Uh, back to the consent now calendar. Consent calendar. All right, I have a motion to move the entire consent calendar. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Director Patterson seconds. Uh, Director uh, McIntosh made the motion. Um, uh, and then we'll ask for a roll call vote. Director Coleman. Yes. Director Katz? Yes. Director McIntosh? Yes. Director Mellon? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Yes. President Lenny? Yes. Um, and I'll just, uh, I meant to make a comment before about uh, item four, um, the creation or, or the contribution to 
uh, helped create the Center for Smart Infrastructure at the University of California. Uh, I feel this is a particularly uh, uh, a great project uh, that we're participating in uh, and uh, appreciate our, our work and the work of our staff to make that happen. I really think that's a, a, big, uh, a big effort that uh, East Bay Mud is helping to make happen for our Bay Area and beyond. Bravo. Here, here. Uh, all right, Determine and dis uh, determination and discussion. Um, uh, I'll, let, I'll turn this over to our general manager to lead us through. Thank you very much. And so first up, we have Marlene virtually to give the Miss Session report. Good afternoon. It's nice to see everybody today. You too. I have, it's been a while. It has. Uh, I have a Miss Session report for you that uh, I wanted to go through sort of what happened last year at the state level. And then I have a, a um, quick update on federal. So starting at the state level, that is kind of a preamble to the written report. Um, I wanted to give you some stats. Um, 2021 was the first of a two year session. So at this midway point, there were about 2,700 measures introduced throughout the year. Of those about 2,400 of them were bills, the rest were resolutions about thir a third of those made it through the process and got to the governor's desk. So he saw a little over 800 bills and he signed most of them. He signed 92% of the bills or 770 bills. He vetoed 66 bills. How that compares to their governors, I thought was kind of interesting. I wanted to share it with you. Um, Governor Newsom has the record um, for the fewest bills considered by any governor. The record was set in 2020 and he came in second in 2021. And I think that's directly attributable to COVID. In 2020, you may recall, the legislature was gone for a substantial part of the early part of session and the governor was really governing by executive order. What was different about 2021, the legislature was there the entire time, but the session was dominated by the budget. So policy stuff really took a back seat to budget. Uh, the budget was unprecedented. We thought collectively that we were coming into 2021 with a deficit. We know there's a structural deficit now years, but we thought there was gonna be a deficit starting. And instead, there was a huge surplus, $75 billion surplus, plus an infusion of money coming in from the federal government in the form of COVID relief that came to the state. So the legislature was grappling with how do we deal with all this one-time money? And um, I will say just in my own experience and in talking to members and staffers, that was the most difficult budget in memory, much more difficult than when there's um, a shortfall. So very interesting. Um, let's see what, on the budget front, to kind of put it in perspective in terms of number of measures, there was about twice as many budget bills this year. Normally we see somewhere around 60 budget bills. This time there were over 120 of them. Of those 120, half of them were signed into law. And the budget started in January and went all the way through till the end of session, and they're not done. Um, it looks like they will be picking up some budget items uh, starting in January to try to finish up 2021 before they launch into 2022. And just this week, the governor is projecting another big surplus for next year, also in the neighborhood of $75 billion. So I think budget will dominate again next year. And what that may mean for us next year is also a lower number of policy bills and a lot of policy stuff being pushed through that budget process. Uh, what Marlene, did the can I, can I yeah. ask you, it, it, can, in California, can we uh, put that money away? We can put that money away for a rainy day, right? It doesn't have to be spent in the year that it's been collected. We just can't borrow right. against 
uh, future debt or anything, but we can put we money can away. Put for into, yeah. We can put it into a rainy day fund and, and they put some into the rainy day fund. Um, always a portion seems to go to the rainy day fund. Um, on, on the borrowing, it, it, it raises a, a, an interesting point. You may remember um, in 2020, there were bond measures, kind of a climate resources bond. There were two of them. There was a, a Senate version and an assembly version. They started 2021 with a bond measure. Both of those got scrapped and the decision was made rather than accumulating or, or taking on more debt for the state with more bond measures, why not run these subject areas through the budget and set up some spending with that surplus? And that's what they did. So we saw budget bills um, in wildfire, uh, climate change, and water that were really categorically something you would normally see in a bond. They pushed it through the budget so that they didn't have that debt burden in the out years. So policy-wise, uh, some of the areas that the legislature did focus on, um, COVID was both budget and non-budget. Marlene? Housing. Yeah. Marlene, oh, Director Coleman has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. It's okay, Marlene, I understand. <laughs> um, yeah, I know that they had the rainy day fund and they paid and helped some structural deficits in local government, did they not, this past fiscal year? Cal uh, I thought on some retire uh, some uh, school boards and cities and things like that that were at structural deficits they didn't come John, to the, the those Colin, the, the not ones sure. that have less, less ability to raise generate revenue like we do or special districts yeah. um there was a pot, go ahead there was a pot of money for special districts to the tune of about a hundred million that was intended for those that don't have enterprise revenues. Okay. And and that was to deal with revenue shortfall issues. Okay. Is, is that your thing? Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm thinking of. And has the LAO's office at all? I mean, this year they didn't expect this coming year uh, budget surplus of 70 some odd billion. Has the LAO's office given any indication when they think that that infusion of tax money basically it's it's money generated from uh, capital gains i believe primarily yeah it may start yeah. running dry there's a couple points in there um one is what what's interesting is the governor is saying about 75 billion and i was looking at the lao's projection and theirs is a little bit different it's a little bit lower um so kind of a, 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 a table setting piece here is there usually is a little difference between what the administration and what the legislative analyst projects. In terms of, of when the money will, will dry up, it's, it's hard to know. That really gets tied into what's happening at the federal level and you start getting into the whole debt ceiling conversation and, and, and how the stock market's responding to that. So there's a there's a, a lot of crystal ball activity with that. Um, in as recently as probably mid-year 2021, when looking at budget projections into out years, the state still is thinking budget deficit. And, and I think that this projection for next year of a surplus is still a bit of a surprise. The stock market is surprising people. But now we're starting to see issues with supply chain disruptions. Uh, some of that, some of the impacts of COVID are starting to manifest and that may affect those revenues in the coming years at the state level, like sooner rather than later, like 2023. My final question then I'll shut up here. Um, within the area that we work with water, wastewater, energy and natural resources, is there a coalition that's working now or talking to about working now to try and tap into some of that apparent surplus as a one-time funding, not as a long-term funding mechanism? So on the money that was allocated this year, mm -hmm. in the budget section of your mid-session report, um, we outline really broadly categorically 
there's going to be action at the implementation level there. And so it's going to be um, as the agencies develop guidelines where guidelines are needed or as they put out those funding opportunities. So the, the usual suspects would be the associations working on that and getting out to their members. Um, but also we as East Bay Mud staff are, are looking at um, in a very cohesive way to try to engage early. And an example of that is on the COVID arrearage relief side of it. Uh, we were very engaged in the guideline development at the State Water Board to be sure that um, we did our best to minimize confusion, maximize efficiency, and get that relief to our rate payers. So there are opportunities to engage for next year. Um, I, that work is really going to start happening in January when we see that governor's January budget come out. And that will be the trigger for folks to really start saying, okay, here are the areas where we're seeing um, funding allocations. Let's work on it. Um, with the asterisk that efforts on drought funding, those aren't stopping because we all know that that's a focus area. It's not gonna go away and we need to stay focused on that. And I know that uh, through the, uh, uh, the governor's issued uh, orders on climate resilience for funding as well as uh, through um, OPR to be doing that. I assume that we're looking at how we may be able to tap into some of those uh, climate resilience funds that may be coming down the pike. Yeah, there's funding for climate resiliency and there's also um, wildfire funding. I'm gonna give you some numbers here. Um, on the, I'm gonna put my glasses on so I can see these numbers. Uh, I can relate. On the water and drought resilience package, it was $4.6 billion over three years. Um, on wildfire, 1.5 billion. And on climate resiliency, it's 3.7 billion over three years. And even though those two of those are multi-year efforts, there's, there's room to do more next year. And I was looking at um, cap and trade, trying to get a sense of what they did there. It's very unclear if they have allocated all of the cap and trade revenue from 2021. So I, I think there are definitely going to be opportunities in these areas for funding. Great, thanks. I have no doubts you'll tap into it. Thank you. Sure. Anything more before I keep going? Okay. Um, I, I was just gonna draw your attention to some of the policy focus areas that the legislature had in 2021 um, and that we think are gonna come back next year. Housing is still a high priority for the legislature. Now, when they're talking about housing, they're adding homelessness as an equal priority. That's new. And so I expect to see more work there and probably more money going in that direction. A lot of the efforts this last year on housing were really about densification. And I think that's gonna continue. Wildfire, um, wildfire, those numbers that I just rolled out, wildfire was one and a half billion. And I think we all know what a challenging year this was for wildfires. So those conversations are not anywhere near done. And I would expect to see more money and more action in that area. And I think that's an area where they're also, we're collectively learning as we go on what do we need to do here. Um, Budget, of course, COVID. COVID as part of the budget. And there may be some COVID policy changes that the legislature and administration want to do. An example of COVID as part of the budget is on the arrearages. If they end up having more money than arrearages, then there may be an opportunity to expand the time frame that that arrearage money covers so that people get all of their COVID debt covered. So there are opportunities there. Uh, on the veto front, I just wanted to give you the three themes that I saw when I went through all his veto messages. Uh, pretty consistent with what he's done in before. One is um, if it cost money that wasn't budgeted or it cost money that was more than what was budgeted, he vetoed it. 
if it's clashing with work that's already happening, he vetoed it. Or if he said no before, he said, basically, I told you no once and I mean it. I'm vetoing it again. Um, I looked for a colorful veto message, sort of like we would see from Governor Brown. And um, Governor Newsom is just a little bit more direct and it, it lacks the philosophical bent. So I don't have any good examples for you. So I'm gonna have to leave you with just those themes. On the mid-session report that you have, I will point out that the very last page is the table that's the crosswalk between the policy categories and the measures that you took a position on last year. In terms of stats, um, you took a position on 22 measures. Of those, 13 were signed into law, two were vetoed. Both veto messages basically said, it's not budgeted, work the issue through the budget process. Uh, six are two-year bills. We may see them next year. And then one failed to find a vehicle. A couple of highlights for you. Uh, the CASA measure on properly labeling wipes that aren't flushable as not flushable. Uh, that was finally signed into law. That was AB 818. That has taken numerous years to get done. It got caught up last year in sort of the COVID log jam. This year, Assembly Member Bloom was able to get that one across the finish line. That's a nice one. Um, next one, SB 222, which is Senator Dodd's uh, state level rate assistance program. That's a measure that we came in with a support if amended position last summer. We were able to secure all of the amendments that we requested, so we moved to a full support. Senator Dodd parked the bill at the end of session. He will bring it back early in the year. Um, he said that he needed to have some conversations with the administration, so we expect to be on board and helping push that one forward as that moves next year. Another one is Senator Glazer's SB 804. And this is the measure that would have established a forestry training center. That one was vetoed and with a message to consider the budget process on that one next year. So we'll reach out to Senator Glazer when we get closer uh, to get a sense of what they intend to be doing with that issue. And the last one is the uh, budget trailer bill language uh, to provide the CEQA clarification for the Oakport Street project. That did not find a home. And I talked with Supply Bank yesterday and they are exploring next steps right now on what they wanna do with that. So stay tuned for more information as we have it. And I've talked quite a bit about budget already. Uh, I will mention quickly on the COVID arrearages, there are three vehicles that were enacted through the budget for COVID utility arrearages. One is $985 million that goes to the state water board. That money would come to the water utilities and wastewater utilities. And the implementation is happening now. Uh, utilities are submitting their applications right now for that money. The second vehicle is about 100 million that came from the federal government. And that is being administered through a different um, department. And that will be a LIHEAP style program. Uh, that one has not been implemented yet. They're waiting on approval from the federal government on that program. And then the last is the utility arrearages that are coming through as part of the rental assistance piece. Uh, bottom line is there's a substantial amount of money out there for utility arrearage assistance. And so our ratepayers should be getting some significant relief through those budget actions. Any questions? Um, not a question. On some bills specifically that I'm going to put on Eastman Mutt Umrah hat here. 
that UMRA either got involved with or potentially should have gotten involved with um, or look at how we're, what we're doing and how it could be impactful to them. If it can be, this, these particular bills can be given to Richard Sykes to distribute to the UMRA partners. Uh, it would be AB 315. Um, let's see, AB 697. SB, I'm sorry, AB 1066. AB 1570 and uh, SB 63. And uh, the other ones are vetoed or whatever. And those are just ones that I'm going to either got involved with or potentially should be looking to get involved with next year. If similar okay. legislation comes up that they would, uh, we know to send it that direction. That'd Absolutely. be awesome. Thank you. Anything more? Okay, quickly on the federal front, things are still swirling. Our earmark request, our funding request is uh, likely to be addressed as part of the omnibus spending negotiations that we expect to be concluded in December. And the infrastructure conversations are still happening. They don't have a final solution yet. Um, it's daily drama. I won't bore you with the details, but I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. That's all I've got. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Um, yeah. And so next we have a resolution to reaffirm the conditions to require uh, the board to continue telecommuting and uh, Derek can answer any questions. Yes. So as the board knows, the Brown Act was uh, recently amended to allow for continued teleconferencing for board meetings and uh, committee meetings and other meetings uh, during a declared state of emergency. So long as the board finds that the state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of the meeting members to meet safely in, in person, or if state and local officials continue to impose or recommend measures to promote social distancing. So on September 28th, the board passed a resolution allowing the continued use of teleconferencing for board meetings. The amended Brown Act requires the board to, within every 30 days thereafter, meet and uh, reconsider the state of emergencies, the circumstances of the state of emergency, and make findings that either the state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of the members to meet safely in, in person, or that state or local officials are imposing or recommending social distancing measures. And so we have prepared a resolution for your approval, and that is the item before you. I'll move item 11. This is John. I'll second it. This is Frank. All right. Moved by Director Coleman, seconded by Director Mellon. Uh, any discussion? Uh, let's have a roll call vote. Director Coleman? Yes. Director Katz? Yes. Director McIntosh? Yes. Director Mellon? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Yes. President Lenny? Yes. Carries unanimously. I do have a question. So if, if it's every 30 days, what, how does that end up working with our board calendar? It seems like it doesn't work very well with our board calendar. So it has to be within every 30 days. So there will be uh, times uh, uh, okay. where it will be, you'll, you'll be adopting the resolution two meetings in a row should you wish to continue to meet via teleconferencing. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. And so for the general manager report, I have two items. First is our coronavirus update. Our vaccination rate uh, continues to increase and is currently around 83% for our employees being fully vaccinated, um, which is similar to Alameda and Contra Costa counties. And so Dave Briggs uh, will provide the brief update. Okay. Good afternoon, President Lenny. Good afternoon, members of the board. Thank you for queuing the presentation up. One moment. Um, there is one public comment, so I can check and up. Uh, the hand went down. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. We'll proceed to slide two here. And as uh, Clifford was mentioning, 
The slide is showing 83% uh, uh, vaccinated uh, staff uh, at the district. Uh, the latest number that we just got uh, briefed on a couple hours ago. Dave, I'm sorry. The hand went up again. Okay. <laughs> Give me one moment. Uh, we can also take comments after. Right. I just want to know if the... Joey Smith, are you commenting before or after the presentation? We can't hear you. After, thank you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, slide two shows 83%, but the latest figure uh, up to date is 86%, just shy of 86% uh, with our latest figures. Um, we know that in very rough numbers, another 7 or 8% are going through the exemption process with approvals starting to roll out. Uh, that leaves another 7 or 8 uh, percent TBD. So that's where we are district-wide with our, our figures. As Clifford mentioned, it is comparable to Alameda County and Contra Costa County. The FDA is meeting literally right now uh, to discuss approval for vaccines for Pfizer in the 5 to 11 age group. If that approval happens, which we expect, uh, the CDC will take various administrative actions probably within a few days and perhaps uh, within seven days, uh, that age group could begin vaccination. So uh, we'll see an entirely new eligible population uh, come into play here, which may drop the county's numbers and kind of redefine uh, who is eligible to be fully vaccinated. But anyway, those, um, there's plenty of vaccine and everybody's logistically ready uh, to uh, uh, administer the vaccine. So I think that age group will progress very, very quickly once it's, once it's approved. Uh, including my daughter. So I'm tracking this very closely myself. Where we are at the district, uh, 147 confirmed employee positives to date, 22 contractor positives. We have had six in October. It's, let's see, so it's the 26th, so almost all the way through the month, we've had six so far. Four of those have been in vaccinated staff. Two uh, were unvaccinated of those six positives. So when you would take into account the different sizes of the subpopulations of the vaccinated, which is approaching 90% at the district, and the unvaccinated group, and you look at that proportionally, it does pencil out that the unvaccinated uh, staff or population is two and a half times greater uh, to get the virus. And that's just based on our own data in October. 14 people, uh, actually it's less than that. Uh, so just uh, up to date figure there, probably down to 10 people are uh, at home right now. Uh, for various uh, co coronavirus reasons. So that number is getting a little bit better. So looking at our policy on slide four, uh, no changes here. We've been testing now for about, I think we're in our seventh week of testing. And so this is for unvaccinated staff who report to district work sites. The mandate, vaccination mandate, takes effect Monday, November 1st. We will be responding to uh, exemption applications in the meantime as we approach November 1st and hopefully responding to as many of those as possible. Before that date, uh, those uh, who are exempted will continue to test uh, on district time, district cost. The meet and confer process is ongoing. And in response to an earlier a board comment from the prior meeting and, and one that I think uh, Marlene covered pretty well, uh, we're continuing to work with our industry associations to recover uh, COVID-related costs, as, as Marlene mentioned, most of that energy is spent with arrearages, but there may be a couple of vehicles out there for recovering COVID-related expenses, and we will pursue those with the associations uh, in the coming months. And that's what I have for you today. Um, how much is Aqua working with us on this, Jeff? I, I don't know if Marlene is still on the line, Director Mellon, um, but I think she's closely. Uh, are you referring to the arrearages or the expense recovery? Expense recovery. Yeah, I, I think that is. I'm still here. Is. Good. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute. Um, so last year, I would say they were they were very engaged, and the Aqua planning meeting is this Friday. And I expect that will be part of the conversation. And I'm certainly happy to raise it uh, because it would be helpful, will be helpful to have our associations continue to focus on these issues. Yeah, I just, it's my ongoing issue of wanting to, to have a sense of what Aqua is uh, 
doing with us and uh, to the extent that it's useful to us. And I'll leave it go like that. All right, we have a speaker. Joey, you should be able to unmute your mic. And your three minutes will start now. Thank you, Risha. My name is Joey Smith. I am the president of Local 2019 here at East Bay Mud. Good afternoon, President Lenny, board members, staff, and those listening. The mandated vaccine situation at East Bay Mud has caused a um, very tense experience for many employees here. There are a number of excellent long-term district employees who are at a crossroads regarding this vaccine. Some who are quite heavy hearted and considering leaving after considering East Bay Mud to be their employment home. Others have already signed papers for retirement or have outright left the district for other employment or entrepreneurial opportunities. These are people who were wonderful resources for the district. There are coworkers who are at odds with each other and some are feeling targeted by supervision. We've done what we can to work with the district on ensuring that those, because I, I don't know of any who are unwilling to be tested, and I don't know of any who are unwilling to be masked, especially for inside places. Please keep in mind that we have another meeting coming up on Thursday to further discuss proposals that we put forward to look out for all of our members as well as other employees who may be in this same situation. And please remember, just because something is lawful does not necessarily mean it's the best answer for everyone. If you don't have an exempt request Perhaps it's not because of their religion. Perhaps it's not because of something proven medically for this particular vaccine. Perhaps they've had a situation with other medical circumstances. So it's, these people are not anti-vaxxers. They just want an opportunity to decide what they will inject into their own bodies. And the fact that some people are actually feeling like the district is overstepping, just a touch, <laughs> and that trying to determine what's best for what goes into their bodies, knowing full well that they're not going to have to answer necessarily because of the way that certain laws are written. And that is where a lot of um, folk are feeling very, very much like beyond disappointed, they're feeling devalued and demotivated to do their best here, which is what they want to do. I'm just saying, we all care for our health and we care about our coworkers as well, which is why they are masked, which is why they're willing to test, and please do consider our proposal that hopefully was brought to you today in closed session. Thank you, Joey, for those comments. Appreciate hearing from you. There are um, no other public comments. All right, any, any other director questions or comments on this item? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, so for the last item is a drought update. And I think we were all happy to get some rain last week. And uh, Dave will talk about the records that we broke 
uh, San Pablo and USL reservoirs both rose uh, quite a bit um, over the storms. Um, I do want to temper our excitement. Um, while we did have 12.3 inches of rain up country, um, you, you know, just as a reminder, in 1976 um, through October, there was 10.3 inches, and the rest of the year we ended up um, at 26 inches total. Um, so today we have an update on our drought operations. We will share some statistics about this past week's rain. Um, if there are questions about um, how we operated through the weekend, we have um, both Dave and Eileen here to answer questions. Um, and then we also spend a bit of time to talk about um, uh, the work we're doing to support Marin water. And I just want to let you know we do have um, the Marin's general manager, Ben Hornstein, uh, who um, is available to answer any questions if you have it. Um, we have a number of speakers, starting with uh, Dave Briggs, then followed by Mike Tognolini uh, and Andrea Polk. Okay, thank you, Clifford. Um, can we cue the presentation? That'd be great. Okay, so before we get to the weather, we'll we'll get to the basic operation that was that's been happening uh, since since October started. And as the board is aware, we've been we've been moving our CVP water since the beginning of the month, and uh, that began on uh, October fourth. Uh, so to date, uh, we're, the, the slide is showing, I'm going to go to slide two here, and uh, the slide is showing 4,600 acre feet diverted uh, through the 21st of October. Uh, at this point, we've probably diverted over 5,000 acre feet uh, from Freewa already, and we're uh, making progress uh, to divert the 33,250 acre feet allocation uh, from the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, so just getting into some more specifics, um, the, among the first water we moved was 2,000 acre feet that were uh, in the process of purchasing from Contra Costa Water District as part of a CVP transfer. We moved that water, uh, that was among the first water we moved, and we have been uh, wheeling uh, 3,200 acre feet to Contra Costa Water District uh, throughout the month as part of a prior settlement. Now. Uh, as I segue into the, the next slide, which gets into the weather we experienced, uh, it, it is sort of appropriate to just make one uh, final comment on Freewa. Uh, among the uh, challenges that we had on Sunday was managing Freeport itself. Uh, we had um, sewer overflows in the Sacramento region, which forced us to turn the intake off at the river. Mm -hmm. We also had more water than we could handle down here. Uh, in San Pablo Creek, which, uh, which uh, motivated us to throttle back some of our operations as well. So uh, we took a little bit of a time out uh, while the storm passed and we're, we're bringing Freeport up to 90 MGD again uh, right as we speak. Uh, so just to look at the weather here, I would say I think Thursday or so we got a forecast that uh, maybe it was Wednesday uh, that a series of atmospheric rivers were coming into Northern California. And I, the numbers that we received at that point were healthy, uh, large numbers, three and a half inches locally, uh, four inches up in the watershed. Uh, just, it's just for reference there in the, the middle uh, set of numbers, the, the average amount of precip we get f for the month of October is about 1.4 inches for the East Bay at our uh, two locations that, that form our East Bay index. And our four station index in the upper McKelney watershed, the average for the month is 2.6 inches. So what we actually received, and this was just through Sunday night. I think uh, Clifford was quoting some numbers that take us all the way through Monday night. Uh, but we, are, uh, we received over seven inches locally in the East Bay, and I believe we're at 12.3 with our four station index up country. And off to the right is a very colorful uh, diagram uh, from NOAA that shows the precip that we, occurred, uh, that we received over a seven day period. Uh, short story is that the, the peach color represents a very intense amount of rain in the um, uh, seven or eight inch uh, neighborhood or even greater than that, uh, which was focused around Marin and certainly our service area and also uh, up, up country in the McKellamy. And you can see some additional numbers here included on the slide. Uh, just, just it, 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 we've been struggling for the past two days about how to characterize this with just, uh, just an amazing amount of uh, rain that we received. And uh, just, just summarizing it here with, with three, three narrative statements seems like uh, we're, we're under, sell, uh, under describing it. But uh, last year we received eight and a half inches in the East Bay for the entire year. And we almost received that in three days. 
uh, here and just uh, just over the weekend. The Capel snowpack is 20, I think it's 28 inches now, which is usually zero in October. Uh, that, that translates into about five inches of water content. So Capel's is already off to a, a great start. Uh, one thing I will mention, and I know that Eileen will probably want to elaborate more on this, is that thank goodness that the rain was remarkably steady at about two to three tenths an hour. Uh, it certainly didn't have to be. Uh, we could have easily seen an inch an hour for a short burst or a, for a short period. But that slow and steady rainfall it, uh, really helped many municipalities uh, maintain their stormwater control. Uh, we had our own facilities that we were trying to manage with the steady downpour. So it was very, very helpful that the rainfall was steady and not concentrated in high intensity bursts. The wind was also relatively uh, mild down here. So the power outages were relatively tame. We still had a bunch of them, but uh, they could have been a lot worse. Uh, in contrast, the winds uh, up country were, were almost, well, actually they were hurricane uh, level uh, at, the, at the peaks in Tahoe uh, over hundred miles per hour, but down here they were relatively mild. So a couple of other aspects of the storm uh, really did uh, mitigate things. Uh, so all of that excitement, as Clifford mentioned, yes, we are, uh, we're not even to November 1st yet. Uh, we, we're not out of the drought. This doesn't change anything that we're doing operationally, uh, but uh, the, uh, the effort that we're, we're going to need to get out of the drought just got a lot smaller uh, with what we received so far. But uh, we're steadying the course, staying the course, and operationally um, not making any changes at this point. So that's what I have. Uh, if you have any questions about operations over the weekend, uh, as Clifford mentioned, Eileen and I can answer them. If not, we'll uh, transition to the next speaker. So I would be interested in, in hearing kind of what, how our wet weather facilities were impacted by this rain and what, what we had to put into operation, what we didn't. Certainly, thank, thank you, President Lenny. First off, I wanna begin my presentation by just saying special thanks and shout out to all the operations and maintenance staff in wastewater. There was over a hundred items identified last spring that needed to get fixed prior to the wet weather season. All hundred items were completed. Knowing the storm that was forecasted for the weekend, we had extra staff, supervisors, operations, maintenance staff at the plant they didn't sleep through the storm. They worked all night. A couple of them bought their own cots. Um, it, was, it was a long weekend for us. Um, and I guess to put it in perspective, um, as Dave said, 6.9 inches in the East Bay um, in Oakland is a lot. And so on a normal day, we have 50 million gallons per day in the wastewater system. Over the weekend, we had to manage flows over 550 million gallons per, per day. It resulted in significant wet weather complications, resulting in a small sanitary sewer overflow and an unauthorized discharge from Point Isabel. Um, during the storm, flows were greater than 200 MGD for over 13 hours at the main wastewater treatment plant, with peaks over 300 MGD. We utilized blending and diversion to storage to man manage these flows. At 2 a.m. on October 25th, the main wastewater treatment plant lost power from pg e on one of the two service lines that provide power to the plant. Our staff jumped into action right away. The on-site power generation station and the one remaining pg e line were able to carry the loads and the plant stayed in service. pg e power was lost at the decor facility near the base of the Bay Bridge at approximately 10 p.m. on Sunday night. Dechlora is probably one of the most important things to leave in the plant. The facility's permanent standby generator was used to provide power. We had an operator out there all night babysitting it and making sure they were refueling. As part of losing the power and transferring to the standby generator, we lost the instrumentation controls. So we had to have operators out there doing titrations to make sure that we met all regulatory requirements. If things could go wrong at the plant, things went wrong. There was lots of flooding, lots of power outages, um, instrumentation that wasn't working. But the staff rose to the occasion, the maintenance staff that we had on standby and present at the site and the operators were all used. All three wet weather facilities were operated to manage the large flows in the interceptor system and reduce flows directed to the main plant. As I said, on a normal day, we're running about 50 MGD. We were sending out over 300 MGD from the main plant. Oakport discharged over 73 million gallons. 
Point Isabel was over 30 million gallons and San Antonio Creek over 13 million gallons. For a total of the wet weather facilities, we discharged over 110 million gallons of stormwater. After the rainfall subsided and levels in the interceptor lowered enough to direct flows to the main treatment plant, we were then able to store some volume at Oakport and Point Isabel, and we returned the rain, remainder flow back to the main plant for treatment. So we really wanted to maximize as much treatment at the main plant, but when we exceeded its capacity, we had no choice but to bring on the wet weather facilities. We were notified on Sunday morning at about 8.30 of uh, what someone reported as a sanitary sewer overflow and Central Avenue um, up in El Cerrito. We dispatched staff, we didn't see anything. We asked to see the photos. It could have been an SSO, but we wanted to assume the worst. We assumed it was an SSO. We reported it to the state regulatory agencies. I was in contact with Baykeeper all weekend long. They got more emails from me than they probably wanted, but they actually very much appreciated it. So they were kept informed of our operations throughout, along with Cal OES, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and my good friend Andrea Polk here at PIO was kept informed throughout the weekend. Um, as a result of the SSO, signage was posted in the area to alert the public to the SSO. We're investigating what caused this surcharge on a manhole based on the photo observation. But when we got to the site on Sunday morning at 8.30, we did not see anything. At 6.40 p.m. on Sunday night, the Point Isabel wet weather facility depleted its supply of bitium, by, uh, sodium bisulfide. And that's used to dechlorid the effluent prior to discharge to, to the bay. Um, so we were kind of at a quandary. Do we stop discharging, which would have resulted in numerous SSOs throughout the East Bay, or we keep discharging? And we decided that to prevent the SSOs along the North Interceptor system in the East Bay, we needed to continue to receive the flows and discharge. Um, so we went ahead and discharged from there. There was unauthorized discharges. It was partially treated. We tried to coordinate and try to aim our operating strategy, which was shared with Baykeeper and the regulator was we try to coordinate to kill the pathogens, but to have no residual going to the bay. That was very tricky. We're doing this all late at night in the dark and then we had process control issues. Um, but we continued to operate. We uh, notified Cali OES, Contra Costa County Health Department, Alameda County Health Department, the regional board. Signage was posted in the area to alert the public about the discharge. Uh, and once again, Baykeeper was notified so they could notify any of the swimmers that swim in the bay there. Investigation into why the sodium bisulfide supply was depleted sooner than anticipated is ongoing. We did reach out to our neighboring agencies to see if any of them had sodium bisulfide to spare. I also checked with Chris Burkez, our uh, supervisor of the render treatment plan, and nobody, everybody was burning through their sodium bisulfide very quickly. Also, there's been issues with chemical deliveries as a result of the pandemic. Uh, there's been issues with not having enough truck drivers. We had already had scheduled a delivery of sodium bisulfide for yesterday morning, and it did not arrive yesterday morning. Um, so I'd say in summary, our staff did an amazing job preparing all summer long. Um, also the training they did, we have a very inexperienced crew in wastewater. Most of them have never operated a wet weather facility in the past, um, and they did an amazing job. We have a lot of new OITs at the plant, and they were great in learning. They got to learn, um, and they got to put out a lot of fires, I would say. Uh, our effluent pumps that discharge to the bay, uh, they kept losing power at the most unopportune times creating challenging issues um, that required rapid and complex responses from our staff. And just wanna say they did an amazing job. Um, we had no violations from our main wastewater treatment plan over the weekend, despite power outages, flooding. You can't go in the back gate. It still continues to be flooded today. The back gate of the main plant by Target um, is completely flooded. So maybe a little more than you wanted, but it was, um, it was a record breaking weekend and can't thank our talented and dedicated staff enough who many of them worked long hours all weekend. All right, any, any uh, board questions for Eileen? Uh, Eileen, it wasn't too much. I appreciate it and I, <laughs> yeah, there's heroics there, there's mistakes made, there's uh, miscalculations and just bad luck 
uh, mixed in all that. I would, I would love to, I, I assume that this will be written up as some sort of report. Uh, I would like to see uh, copies of that to understand more. I know it's a, a continuing challenge of, uh, you know, combination of our infrastructure and backups and power and all that. I, uh, I uh, try to follow it as, as best as possible um, all, all the various incidents and, and issues that we have there. I want to make sure that we're giving uh, you and the, the staff the tools you do you, that you uh, need uh, to do a, a job and maybe a little less heroics and uh, a, a, little, uh, a little more um, support in whatever way we can that way. Certainly. I was planning to include a fairly lengthy update in the monthly report, but I can also provide additional information to a separate report too. Great. Marguerite? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, it, you know, you can plan for something and then you get two or three times that and, you know, all those best laid plans kind of go out the window. So I think I, I agree with Doug, you know, it's, um, you know, you rose to the occasion and, and, and at the same time could do everything. I mean, we had a, you know, on the water side, we had a couple of really pretty spectacular main breaks um, that, uh, one of which was caused by a contractor that really, oh, yeah. really contributed to the cascade of, <laughs> of uh, you know, issues in, in Oakland for sure, um, and and taxing on our on our on our crews. So, um, you know, I think we showed East Bay Mud's you know, best face uh, in this you know event on both both sides of the house. Um, I do have a request, which is if we could get the, I, I would love to see sort of the detailed um, precipitation numbers, um, you know, from our, our two East Bay stations and our uh, four uh, upcountry stations and the index, if possible. I've had a number of people, um, you know, asking me, um, you know, exactly how much we got. And I know we're still trying to exactly figure that out, but, um, you know, by day and then uh, cumulative for the event, that would be great. We can get, um, we can get that to you this, um, this week. And let's all pray the storm door stays open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And okay. Do you have anything else, Dave? No, I was just going to transition to Lena if uh, now is the time to go over uh, uh, statewide storage. So I'm going to queue up Lena's slide here and, while she gets ready. And while while Dave does that, um, what Director Young was talking about as far as the, the contractor hit, we had a contractor drill into our 48-inch Sequoia Aqueduct in Oakland. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, on Friday. <laughs> Afternoon, I think, right? If I'm not mistaken, the, the timing wasn't good. How about that? Terrible. Murphy's Law. Contractor was named Murphy, wasn't he? <laughs> uh, go ahead, Lena. Um, good afternoon, President Lenny and board members. Uh, the state is also responding to the changing weather conditions. And since August, the district's water rates have been under curtailment orders from the state restricting all of our diversions because of dry conditions. And in anticipation of this past weekend's atmospheric rivers, the state had temporarily lifted the curtailment order on October 15th. So the district could resume diversions into our storage facilities at Party and into um, the McKelmy aqueducts. The state plans to monitor the hydrologic conditions on a daily basis and they'll modify the orders, the curtailment orders on a weekly basis as runoff forecast changes. But because storage conditions in the state are below average levels as shown in the graphic on the right, and the overall statewide conservation is around 5% instead of the voluntary reduction goal of 15% that the governor had set out, this is compared to last year, the governor expanded the emergency drought declaration to cover the entire state now, adding eight Southern California counties. And this was needed in order to preserve the state's surface and groundwater supplies in the event we go into a third dry year. And as part of the governor's declaration, water agencies like ours are directed to implement our water shortage contingency plan, 
which is a part of the urban water management plan. And the district has already uh, taken a head start on that. We started the implementation when the board declared a stage one drought on April 27th. And through the district's regulations, uh, section 29, we're already implementing a lot of the actions that call for um, limiting wasteful water use. Uh, that's pretty much all we have in terms of summary from the state actions. I can turn it over to Mike to talk about our uh, adventures with Marin Municipal. That's the next slide, Risha, please. Okay, do I have control of it? Okay, thank you, Lena. Good afternoon. Uh, just uh, going to provide an update on our ongoing uh, work uh, for regional drought assistance, specifically with Marin Municipal Water District. Uh, just uh, last week, we did execute a memorandum of understanding with MMWD to explore the possibility of wheeling water for them in 2022. And a couple of key principles that I wanted to point out before we go into the details. One, the wheeling will not impact East Bay Mud customers, nor the district's ability to obtain its own transfer water to meet its needs during the drought. The Freeport facilities are not available for MMWD at this time, and staff has recommended use of the Hayward inner tie. Uh, and the water source for MMWD will not come from East Bay Mud. In other words, they will, uh, the district will not be selling water to MMWD from its sources. Um, MMWD has looked at a variety of alternatives and determined that the most viable alternative is to uh, build a pipeline across the Richmond San Rafael Bridge, connect to the East Bay Mud system in Richmond. <clears throat> and as we've explained, our capacity uh, due to pressure constraints in our distribution system, the capacity would be limited to about 8 million gallons per day at this location. Uh, we're co coordinating weekly with MMWD, and uh, MMWD is also in, in discussions with many other agencies that would be involved in moving water uh, eventually uh, from uh, the state system, uh, eventually to MMWD uh, via the Hayward Intertie. Yeah, Mike, we have uh, two questions. I think first, Director Young, and then Director McIntosh. Mm -hmm. um, mine was not raised. It was raised from before. I'm lowering it now. Director McIntosh? Yes, yeah, I'll wait until he's finished. Okay, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so what are some of the recent activities involving MMWD? Uh, last week, the MMWD board approved a storage and transfer agreement with Contra Costa Water District that would allow MMWD to store water in Los Vaqueros Reservoir and potentially purchase up to 5,000 acre feet of water directly from Contra Costa. In addition to that uh, agreement, the MMWD ap approved a notice of exemption and pre-purchase of pipe for the bridge crossing. Uh, um, so in order to have a, a pipeline in place by next July, uh, which is the objective of MMWD to have something in place by next summer, uh, the pipe has to be purchased in advance, so they've initiated that process. During the, the meeting and actually prior to the meeting, uh, the city of Richmond has, and the community uh, in Richmond has raised concerns about the connection location and community impacts, <clears throat> specifically the uh, actual location of the potential connection and uh, proposed pumping plant, as well as construction related impacts having to do with trail access uh, that would be blocked for up to six months uh, in the area around the Richmond Bridge. Uh, the district is working with the city of Richmond and MMWD to ensure clear roles and responsibilities, uh, participated in a meeting today with the city of Richmond and will continue to meet um, uh, with community members and uh, the city as MMWD works with the city of Richmond uh, to uh, resolve any concerns. And this is probably a good point to stop before we go on to outreach. Director McIntosh, if you have questions. Sure. Um, so it sounds to me um, as if regardless of where MMWD gets their water, it runs through our system. So what about co-mingling? Um, 
What about taste issues? What about the quality of water? Yeah, so uh, I can tr try to answer that. Uh, just to say that uh, moving water through the Hayward inner tie, so we would be getting additional water from that location potentially, and that would be water coming from the city of Hayward that gets their water from San Francisco Hetch Hetchy system. So uh, okay. our evaluation of the water quality impact would be minimal other than potential operational um, um, impacts related to, uh, you know, stirring up sediment and pipelines, those sorts of things. But those would be temporary. I think that the uh, ultimately the water quality we would be receiving through Hayward would be uh, comparable to the water quality that we deliver to our customers in that area. And, and just so quickly, just for, uh, sorry, for Hayward, we would flush those lines before we would take correct. the water. So, uh, and then maybe Mike, if you can address um, for Richmond. Okay, so. Yeah, the uh, impact to Richmond. So in terms of water quality for the city of Richmond, there would really be no change uh, whether or not um, water was being moved to Marin. Uh, Richmond would likely be receiving water from the Soprante uh, uh, treatment plant. And that would be the case with or without a marine connection. All right. But what I'm hearing is likely. I'm not hearing emphatics. I'm hearing you use the word likely. So are these issues that we haven't quite flushed out yet? <laughs> I'm going to ask Dave Briggs to answer that more specifically. Thank you. Hi, uh, Director McIntosh. Yeah, as, as, as Mike was mentioning, um, regardless of what water may be moved to Marin through Richmond, Richmond will receive the same water. We will supply Richmond from Sobrante during most of the times of the year with all of the taste and odor protections we will employ there to make sure the water is as high quality as possible. Uh, I'm not anticipating Sobrante will be offline much uh, until the drought is over, uh, but if it is offline, all of the water for Richmond will come from Arinda. And really the water that Richmond sees is independent of what, what would happen for Marin. Uh, is that, and the flushing that Clifford was referring to uh, mm -hmm. is, is far to the south uh, near Hayward. Uh, and that's just to prepare the inner tie. Uh, customers in that part of the service area may see a slight difference in water quality as the water emanating from San Francisco is slightly different, but we've done that before. And as long as we do the right preparatory uh, work ahead of time, I think those issues are manageable as well. So um, I, I'd like to know, you know, this seems to be steamrolling. Um, and it's a huge concern to me. I mean, we started out, we, the district, East Bay Mud, started out that we would support MMWD's investigation. And now um, I'm hearing from our staff at East Bay Mud, that this seems to be something that it certainly hasn't come to the board, um, but it's sounding like staff is totally on board with this project without any board vote or consideration. Can you respond to that, please? Uh, sure. So I, I'm getting very concerned about this, um, and I, I, it sounds like staff is steamrolling this. Um, and over the board's vote and consideration. And I have a problem with it. Okay, sure. <clears throat> I'll answer that. And uh, uh, by saying that the agreement that we've entered into with MMWD is only to study whether this is possible and whether it can be accomplished without impact to East Bay Mud customers. There is no That's agreement in place. There is no agreement in place to move water um, for Marin, and that agreement will absolutely come to the board for consideration if we are able to determine that it can be at the staff, if the staff can determine that it can be done with minimal impact, we would then bring it to the board for uh, board consideration. And it sounds like staff is saying that it can be done with minimal impact. Is that what you're saying or not? Uh, the, so far, the preliminary analysis would indicate that if we limit the diversion to 8 million gallons per day, we can avoid pressure impacts in the area around Richmond. And as we've already shared with MMWD, we do not have capacity in Freeport available to them, so they would have to move water through the Hayward Intertie, which means they will need to move water through a series of other agencies in order to get it to Hayward and then to East Bay Mud. 
So it sounds like it's costly water, hugely costly water, correct? Um, yeah, I, um, I can only speak to what uh, the cost would be for moving water for East Bay Mud, and the wheeling cost will certainly be significant to use East Bay Mud facilities. So Clifford, um, as general manager, I, I want to be clear what staff is saying is that you're still uh, cooperating in MMWD's investigation, but we have not signed on for this project at all. I need to hear that. Understood, Director McIntosh. And before we move forward, we will bring it to the board for consideration. Well, obviously, I mean, that's obvious, Clifford. What, what I want to hear is that staff has not made a determination at this point in time. Uh, yeah. Or have you? Well, st staff has done the preliminary investigation and has determined that water, so as Mike shared, water, we, we do not have extra capacity in the Freeport facility. Um, and if I've got that. And, and if this were to work, it would have to come through the Hayward Inner Tide, but it can only come at a maximum of 8 million gallons per day to... I get that. Yeah, without impacting our customers. And, and that is the only way that it can be done without um, impacting our customers. Um, and so... Well, okay, finish, Clifford. Okay. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want to... Go ahead. Um, you know, the city of Richmond is raising concerns. Uh, I'm raising concerns. I, I think it feels like a steamroll. That's the way I'm feeling right now. And um, I hope that's not the case coming from our staff. That we, this is something by the time we get to the vote on this, it will almost be a done deal. And I'm simply asking staff to make certain that this is not a done deal when it comes before us. Lisa, could I could I step in a little bit because I I've mm -hmm. had the uh, as as we discussed um, I've been part of the the highest level meetings. Not there's a lot of lower level meetings that are happening between right. the two districts. Right, and I have right, and and you're By invited to be part of those going forward uh, before we get to that point uh, where it is brought to the board. Um, and you know it's it, it has been moving quickly. Uh, because obviously they, they need to make decisions as to whether this is going to be, you know, their, their plan for relieving their drought pressures or their potential drought pressures for next year. Uh, that's why it's moving quickly. Uh, I don't, of course, you know, I've been part of the meeting, so of course I'm not going to feel like it's a steam, steamroller, uh, and I can see where others haven't, including yourself, but especially uh, mm -hmm people in electeds in Richmond who have not been part of the information that has been in the back and forth that's going on where, you know, it's a, it's just a, uh, you know, a, a um, it's one of those things of, you know, how much time do you spend getting all the information out uh, and how much do you spend the time just kind of figuring out whether this is even going anywhere. Uh, and, and I think there has been people from uh, MWD who have said, they wish they had started earlier in reaching out to Richmond and, and doing things, but nothing has been decided yet. Everything is in the determination phase. But I think you're also right that, you know, usually when things come to the board, the staff feels pretty strongly about what they're recommend, recommending, and it wouldn't come to the board unless they were recommending uh, that, that this go forward. Otherwise, it won't even come to the board. It'll just be another idea that was a good idea, but didn't really work out or something. Yeah, my dog is is um he's upset voicing too, his can... opposition yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway so that's that's i my... will rest right. on this that i don't want to feel steamrolled um the city of richmond does not and um i i i look forward to those participate in those meetings to come uh and i'll leave it at that all right, we have questions right. from Andy and Marguerite and then John and Frank. Right. Thank and, you. And uh, I, I, one other question of clarification. Clifford, we have um, 
uh, been standing by in case there's questions that need to be directed at, at M MW. He is, well, he, is, right? he is online. And we also have one person for public comment after the board makes their comments. Okay. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, thanks. Yeah. For, first, I'd like to underscore uh, what Director McIntosh was referring to regarding uh, community impacts in the city of Richmond. Um, you know, I've, I read what uh, Richmond Mayor Tom Butt has uh, commented about in the Richmond Standard, and I uh, do think we need to provide the the, the same level of uh, community engagement, the same level of community respect and uh, consideration of alternatives and mitigation measures that we would for any project. Uh, this is not the time to be thinking of emergency exemptions to the California Environmental Quality Act. This is the time to be engaging in uh, uh, neighbors. You know, if we're gonna do something that is a matter of agency neighbors helping agency neighbors, we need to make sure that our, our own customers are treated with that same respect. Um, so I um, w would like, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail because a, a lot has been um, uh, stated offline and in the in the media, but um, I, I think that sentiment needs to be understood uh, uh, from from. Um, the second is I think a water supply issue, and it's one that the, the this presentation doesn't really address. Something I've alluded to numerous times in the past when talking about regional reliability initiatives. We need to have a common understanding about water use efficiency. If we're going to be providing our infrastructure as a conduit. Uh, for a, a continued uh, uh, reliability, we need to make sure that we're not enabling waste and that we're enabling efficient use of water. Um, so that, that's a principle that um, I've never seen in any presentation to this board really uh, quantified uh, and, and put in implementable uh, language. Um, if, if this is a technical challenge, I'd be glad to talk with um, a, a um, ad hoc committee of the board or, a, or, or staff to work on some of those concepts. If this is an intergovernmental um, uh, challenge, then we need to tackle it because I, I do see, you know, this, this is coming up to, up to the front um, very fast and we need to make sure that we have that kind of understanding in place before we engage. And, and maybe before we move on to the next, um, you know, we did hear your comment at the last board meeting about the, um, the efficiency, and maybe Mike can address that. We did include something in the memo, but um, left it out of the presentation. Yeah, there was something in the memo we did not include in the presentation, and that is that our, um, any wheeling agreement that we negotiate is, is going to be, be consistent with our board-approved principles for um, use of Freeport unassigned capacity, which really gives board guidance on any kind of wheeling activity that the district uh, is involved in. And that includes specifically some language that was added a couple of years ago that uh, addresses the, the very question of water use efficiency and consistency of and standards that are being applied for anyone that's going to be wheeling water through our system. Director Young? Uh, need to unmute. Uh, sorry, oh, I will uh, stand with the comments of my colleagues, um, Director McIntosh and Director Katz, um, uh, with regard to community outreach. I mean, I do, uh, you know, I understand that Marin is kind of desperate. Uh, uh, maybe this weekend's storm event um, helped a little bit. Um, I heard there was like 27 inches on Mount Tam or something like that. Um, that, uh, however, you know, it also sounds, this is a question in my mind. It's like, seems like there are a lot of, it's like uh, building a structure with kebab blocks. If anybody has, you know, had kids and, and use those is, is that they don't have, they have an agreement for water from CCWD, but to get that water, I mean, it sounds, seems like a very complicated series of, um, uh, movements uh, through. So I don't understand how the CCWD part fits in with the Hayward Intertie is one question I have um, from, from um, reading this. I'm also cons have concerns about Marin um, essentially uh, looking for sellers 
of water that we might be looking to buy from and whether those conflicts are um, you know, also getting addressed within this as either, I don't know, no compete or I don't know, something um, that, that we don't want to end up not being able to get additional water supplies uh, as a result uh, that we might need as a result of, um, you know, of this, uh, um, you know, transfer agreement. Um, or wheeling agreement, um, sorry, transfer, really the wrong word, wheeling agreement, um, if we were to um, go ahead with it. Um, so that's, that's it for me. Yeah, and, and there are quite a number of groups, and you know, as we outlined the memo, uh, you know, a lot of pieces have to fall in place uh, for this to work with Marin, and Marin staff has been working with us. We did express those same concerns, Director Young, about um, you know, multiple agencies contacting potential sellers, and they've been working with us to make sure that, um, you know, we don't, uh, uh, we coordinate. And I can briefly describe how water moves from Los Vaqueros to the Hayward Intertie, and it would involve multiple parties and exchanges. Uh, the way that would happen is that Contra Costa Water District does divert water from the Delta, as does the uh, South Bay Aqueduct. So through an exchange with the South Bay Aqueduct, uh, Contra Costa could not divert from the Delta and their, their diversion would instead go into the South Bay Aqueduct. From the South Bay Aqueduct, it could be exchanged uh, through a number of contractors, inclu uh, including Alameda County Water District, Valley Water, um, uh, in, uh, for their share of water that they get from Hetch Hetchy, or it could be delivered directly to San Francisco potentially and through one of those mechanisms, get water, get credit in San Francisco's system that could then be delivered uh, to the city of Hayward and then from the city of Hayward uh, through the uh, Hayward Intertie. So it's quite complicated, but it is, the plumbing is there uh, that it is uh, possible. Director Coleman? Yeah. Great, thank There's you. Um, I, ends up with the short end of the water quality stick on that, though, in those those successive things, but um, not us. So it's not us. That's good, but yep. it's, boy, sounds messy. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, I do believe that Clifford and Michael will be working in the best interest of the board if and when it does come to the board. Um, there's a lot of moving parts as it's been described by everybody um, and clearly nobody on our board is going to want to put our customers in jeopardy both in terms of water quality or availability period. However, I guess I'm looking at this sort of parking back to when we negotiated Freeport long before many people got on this board. And I did read Mayor Butt's comments in the newspaper as well. And I remember reading the comments up in Sacramento when Freeport was being built and they were not unsimilar. This really, I think, presents an opportunity from a regional perspective to develop, bring in the last link, if it's gonna happen, which is Marin County being tied into the Bay Area uh, water market. Um, and I would hope if it, if it does happen, that the pipeline, if it's built, is not gonna be taken down like it was after the 76, 77 drought, but left there so it can meet the needs if the needs, the needs need to be met in the future. I hope that M MWD is going to be looking at going into the enlarged Los Sacaros. You know, we'll see where DSAL goes if they join a, join in that uh, process as well, depending where that goes. But really, I, I guess I, I guess I'm looking at it having worked for a number of years on Freeport to get it where it is. And now it's a huge success. This is an opportunity to really bring um, the last link of the Bay Area into a regional reliance of water supply. Uh, and yes, Marin needs to do their job to bring additional supply in and need to do their job of additional uh, storage. Um, but they're in a critical situation as we have been in the past. We're not gonna do anything, I believe, on our board to put any of our customers at risk. It's not just, that's not the way we operate, but it does present, I think, an opportunity to really enhance our regional water system here in the Bay Area. Those are my comments. 
Thank you, John. I appreciate that perspective. Lisa? Yeah, thank you for those comments, John, but it's not going to run through your backyard. Um, and, you know, I, I still um, say they came to the city of Richmond the very last minute. I mean, um, I haven't been in these meetings. Um, so I understand MMWD's need for water urgently, but it can't be on the back of Richmond residents. Um, and that's simply my point. Uh, we should have been included long before this juncture. Um, and I'm hoping going forward, they will do a better job as well as us. Uh, we need to do a better job apprising our citizens of what, what we're even contemplating. But on, John, you mentioned a good point, and that is um, a regional, uh, fine. I'm wondering what does MMWD do with their recycled water? Um, you know, if they're building pipelines, can they build one coming into West County? Because that's a huge problem that we're having, um, a shortage of source water for recycled water. So I'm just sort of throwing out there Maybe there are options that could benefit West County, Richmond, and West County uh, going forward. So I hope MMWD, and I know Ben is on the line, uh, I hope you guys will look at ways to benefit uh, Richmond and West County going forward in this project. Ben, that, would you... I truly am done. Thank you, Director McIntosh. Ben, would you like to um, uh, respond to that? Oh, I don't want Ben's oh, okay. response in this meeting. <laughs> I certainly don't. He just wants to, him to hear I it. I want to see it in writing. I want to see it going forward, not thank, in this meeting. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Director McIntosh. Uh, and, and Lisa, I just want to say one more time, not to discount anything you've said, because uh, it's all not only valid, but, but true um, in terms of the timing of all this. But it has happened very quickly, and in my mind, uh, at least because I, you know, there's been three meetings uh, that have happened approximately two weeks apart. So that's about six weeks that, that I've been involved in direct discussions of this. Uh, and it was all really focused on is, is this theoretically even possible? Do we, you know, do we need to, to uh, take it the next step or is it something that, uh, you know, is really not even in the realm of the possible? Um, but, you know, it's always important to bring in uh, you know, the community uh, and any of all uh, board members who are, you know, uh, in, uh, directly are their constituents who are directly impacted. And I'm glad that you're able to join any meetings going forward. And once again, give assurances. Thank you for finally inviting. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, like I say, I, I thought it was kind of more on the level of theoretically possible and, and, uh, but anyway, not to be defensive at all, you're right. Um, so uh, I, I guess that's all I have, have to add to that. Okay. Oh, and, and just lastly, kind of repeating what everybody else has said, this is going to get past the board of directors without everyone making sure that they've had their questions answered uh, and, and concerns dealt with. Uh, Bill, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I was just going to really take a step back uh, during this whole period, which is very, very unusual, when uh, MMWD asked for assistance from East Bay Mud, there was a different climate at that point in time. If you look at the report, the draft report, page three at the bottom, where it talks about the media, you see, uh, MMWD, it cast a reflection. It did not meet its quota in terms of reducing water consumed. It had no real supply um, alternatives because everything was running dry. So everything came forward kind of on an emergency and 
when East Bay Mud responded that it would only do something if it didn't cost our ratepayers, tax them, or in any way impact them uh, to use our facilities and whatnot. And further, that we would not be able to participate even in uh, putting pipe in place on the bridge over there. Uh, the impacts further that have been described here talk about the people of Richmond having to give up uh, some of their land holding issues, particularly as it involves a pumping plant. Uh, these things weren't really uh, good press necessarily for MMWD based on the fact that they didn't meet their quotas. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not good neighbors, but it means that the discussion didn't go deep enough in terms of our board or our communities who also have a say. I think that's the kind of thing that uh, uh, Lisa is pointing to uh, with due concern. And uh, I wanna make sure that that picture is on the table. All of the media mentioned in the report uh, covered the Bay Area and it talked about everybody and what they were doing and what they weren't doing. That creates an atmosphere that says sometimes you are responding to an irresponsible entity. And, and I just want to make sure that climate is heard because that's what uh, is being expressed by the people of Richmond in particular. So I, I just put that on board to say not that we wouldn't do something to try and help, but not at the expense of our water customers, constituency, as Richmond is. So I, I just put that out so you have a deeper understanding of what some board members are saying and what their concerns are. That's it. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, Frank, I think you were next. Thank you. Um, you know, this, this thing has actually been hanging around in the background because earlier this year, I had some constituents calling me saying, what's this they hear about us giving water to Marin? And I checked with the general manager and he said, well, there's some discussion, but we're not giving anybody any water. And I said, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. But the idea that this is sort of snuck up, I think this has been hanging in the background. And then all of a sudden, when things got really dry, it blew up. And that's not how business should be done. John has a point in that you have these things as a plan that is discussed. And, and you know, it's, it's like the inner ties. Why do we have inner ties? because we know one day we're gonna need it. Not, we need an inner tie now because we gotta have it built and get it done right away. So I appreciate the fact that Lisa is gonna be kind of a point person on this, but I also think that there's more that has to be done here than just look at what the what is a, a short-term situation. We. I've said it, I'm gonna keep on saying it because somebody believes me. We live in a drought environment with interludes of rain. That means we plan for a drought environment. I'm worried about the fact that planning wasn't done here. That's my piece. All right, thank you. Any, any other comments, questions? Andy, I still see your hand up. I don't know, if, I assume that you just didn't take it down yet. It was an old hand, but what I'd like to uh, briefly say is, is that, um, you know, I, I, I will take a closer look at what staff put in the report uh, in terms of um, water use efficiency. Um, I do think we need continued discussion to make sure that um, that we get appropriate amount of clarity um, as uh, if we are to move forward. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And then we just have a few additional slides that Andrea Polk will talk about in terms of our outreach efforts. I have one um, speaker for public comment. Joey Smith, are you commenting on the MMWD project or the drought update overall? Uh, MMWD. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start your three minutes now. Thank you very much, Risha. Um, with best respects to President and Vice President of this board, and thanks to all of the other directors who have made your comments. My name is Joey Smith. I am a resident of Richmond, California. I am a ratepayer. I am a constituent. I am an employee at East Bay Mud, and I am a community activist. There are many facets to this matter. Not only did Marin not plan properly and expect us to get their tails out of crack, no matter how much I understand it is very important for us to have great business relationships with other water entities. I, I understand it and I respect it. The fact of it is Marin County has had contentious relationships with Contra Costa County and especially the city of Richmond for years, unless Marin is benefiting from what's happening afterwards. But it doesn't stop there because these impacts go beyond Contra Costa County. It goes beyond Richmond. I attended that meeting of uh, Contra Costa Community, uh, excuse me, Contra Costa Transportation Authority. And they were really, really making it sound like it, everything was decided. And yep, East Bay Mud's on, on board and this is what we're gonna do. So thank you for your response on the taste and quality staff. Um, but here's the thing, if we do go forward with this, who is going to be responsible for this pump? And why is the city of Richmond having so little to say with where that pump is gonna be located? The noise, the disruption for residents and businesses, the carbon footprint impacts are there as well, because this bicycle route is going to be shut down for, they say, up to six months. But you know how sometimes construction situations go on longer. That is an issue that is involved with this bridge. So the idea of the pipe coming across could be a benefit but they could also figure out a way to say, nope, mm -mm, we, we got to have these other lanes. Now, that's not East Bay Mud problem. I do understand that. But here's the thing. I, I feel bad that any of our directors may have felt um, less informed than they probably would have liked to have been. And I appreciate the representation that we have had from East Bay Mud dealing with Marin. But thank you so much for speaking up and saying, it's not our problem to fix, but being good neighbors, we will assist you in the way that will not cause so many impacts on our folks, on our, on our customers, okay? But this pump, that's the question that's not getting answered. If that's the way that we go, no one has stated who's going to be responsible for this pump, who's going to maintain this pump, and how is it going to uh, have minimized disruption and impacts on the residents and business people in the city of Richmond. Joey, your three minutes have concluded. If you could wrap up your comments. I have completed. Thank you very much for your time and attention. What I would additionally ask is please, any appropriate uh, communication that's going out, I'd love to have it, and I can provide my email information. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joey, for those, those comments. Those are greatly appreciated and very informative. All right, should we get on to customer outreach? On yes, thank item? you. And Andrea, go ahead. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, President Linney and members of the board. I just wanna give you a very brief update on where we are regarding uh, water supplies and drought communication. So we continue to work um, with our customers to encourage conservation. Um, we have been doing more work both in uh, Spanish and adding, um, I'm sorry, in English and adding some Spanish. Um, we're nearing 70 drought presentations, um, including webinars. The most recent one was our water quality seminar this past Wednesday on Water Wednesday. We had 106 attendees and um, it was quite successful. Next slide, please. You may be aware we've done a number of press releases um, in the month of October, uh, one on bringing in our Sacramento River water, one joint press release um, with Contra Costa Water District regarding the Los Vaqueros JPA. Um, also a press release on recycled water, uh, letting folks know about our connection um, to the golf course in San Ramon, and also a media release um, this past last week on Water Wednesday topic. Um, the number here of drought interviews continues to increase daily. So um, we continue to thread that needle um, this, this you know, past couple of days about being um, excited about the amount of water that we received both in the East Bay and upcountry, um, and also encouraging um, our customers to continue their water conserving practices. Um, the most recent interviews, in addition to the ones that are on the slide, um, KTBU uh, tonight, um, also KGO radio and um, Cron 4 last night. Um, in addition, we also had one interview on um, wet weather issues with KQED. Next slide, please. And uh, for social media, we continue to um, increase the number of followers and um, our next door post on um, encouraging customers to reduce their irrigation received nearly 15,000 impressions. That's all I have for today. Are there any questions? Don't see anything. Right. Uh, that's Thanks, it. Andrea. Thanks for all the work you, you and your team are doing to uh, outreach to the public, keep them informed, and keep the media, keep feeding the media <laughs> the appetite for this, this subject matter. <laughs> it is never ending. <laughs> Thank you. And that's my last report. Uh, all right. Um, we are now at. Let's just see here, uh, reports and director comments. Uh, committee reports, minutes from the October 12th planning committee were included in the agenda packet. We'll now receive reports from today's um, committee meetings. I'll start with the redistricting ad hoc committee meeting. Uh, we had a relatively short meeting. Uh, staff presented three options uh, for us to um, look at. Uh, these are all options that just have to do with changing the boundaries between wards five, that's mine, and ward seven, that's Frank. Uh, and, um, and we are recommending, uh, voted to recommend uh, the first of those options, which created the, the most um, population change. We could have gotten by with just changing uh, one uh, census district, for example, uh, but it also kind of made the boundaries even more even with the uh, Interstate 880 boundary to make it easier for us to know who's or for constituents to know and for Frank and I to know certainly uh, or whoever might be holding these wards uh, to know where the boundaries are, which is basically along 880 that way. So um, that was that was the decision today uh, to move that forward. More more coming uh, next. The Sustainability and Energy Committee, Director Young. Yeah, hi, um, let me go on camera here. Um, just FYI, I'm starting to feel the effects of my Moderna booster, oh. um, <laughs> which I got yesterday right around this time. Um, 
Uh, we heard several reports. Um, let me just pull up um, my agenda. Um, we had the um, our uh, resource recovery report um, where we heard um, a, about a number of um, different um, projects, including the latest on our food waste um, processing, um, which has resumed. Um, a potential for a hydrogen fueling station, um, the uh, employee charging stations that have been set up at the plant, um, and somebody can help me remember the other part of that. Um, uh, so that was report number one. Um, report number two um, was about our um, uh, Sorry, um, our is the, uh, uh, greenhouse gas inventory. Oh, I thought actually we had our renewable energy update next, actually, which was um, reporting on the Duffel PV project um, as well as the um, uh, in conduit hydro um, project that we're going to be able to do at um, Piedmont um, through a grant. Um, and a vendor, which could be very exciting. Um, and then lastly, we heard about the greenhouse gas inventory, uh, had a report on that for 2020, um, which um, shows continued um, declines in our emissions. Um, however, the uh, impact of some uh, rules on how wastewater em um, emissions are counted um, is, uh, you know, challenging us um, to, to figure out how to uh, continue to stay on track. And I don't know if other committee members have anything to add. Okay. Also note that it's the 20th anniversary for the uh, uh, food, food waste program. Ah, well, there you go. Uh, all right, uh, on to the next committee, Finance Administration, uh, Director Patterson. Yes, uh, let me first say that uh, I want to salute our finance team. Uh, Director of Finance uh, brought forth today a splendid uh, committee presentation which involved the financial review of fiscal year 2021. It also involved the auditors and one of their CPAs was present in presenting the so-called quote, clean audit for fiscal year 2021. Uh, I wanna say that Uh, our finance officer, Skoda, has developed a tremendous team and linked together with the key performance indicator report, it showed East Bay Mud as being outstanding in its financial capacities throughout the system. The quarterly reports were all given as item nine on the consent calendar, and you got those. And uh -huh. I want, uh -huh. you have approved them already. And I do want to say finally that as we look ahead for 2022, we're standing on firm ground and thank all of those that contributed this morning. That's my report. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, we are now I, on to- Sorry, if I may interject something. So during the finance committee meeting, um, several votes were taken by roll call to accept the committee reports. Uh, Director Katz was able to hear the reports, but for technological reasons, wasn't able to participate in the roll call. But we do wanna create a record after the fact that he didn't vote to accept the committee reports. 
Thank you, Derek. Uh, yes, confirming that I um, uh, was uh, voting aye on the uh, annual power sales report and the key performance indicators report um, in all of the motions in that meeting. Um, but the technical difficulties only affected the last two. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, uh, please submit items for future consideration to the general manager. Uh, we're at director comments. If anyone has any additional comments to add today, Okay, seeing none, um, uh, we'll adjourn this meeting and uh, ask that everyone take care of yourselves and others and be safe. We'll see you, you in all. two weeks. Thank Bye. you. Stay safe and be well.